All right, wonderful. So let's get started. Um, Joanna, can you can you advance to the next slide? Just a, a few housekeeping items here. Please keep your audio muted throughout the webinar or throughout the event. And also, if you have a question, you can post it on the chat and I'll be happy to ask to our panelists today. Wonderful. So let's get started. Hola, everyone. Welcome to the first leading uh, in tech Latinx style virtual round table. Uh, we put this together because we want to inspire more Latinos and Latinas out there to join and build great careers in the tech industry. My name is Adriana Gilminer, and, uh, and Joanna here Aguirre is helping us. Is helping. Oh, okay, we're good. Is <laughs> helping us here with logistics. So I just wanted to uh, check. Um, and I head up uh, marketing for a very hot startup here in Seattle called Cumulo. We help organizations store, manage, and build unstructured with unstructured file data that is images and videos and biotech uh, data, you know, all of the file data, all of the digital content that is really generated at great speed in this growing digital economy of ours. I was raised in, and born and raised in Venezuela, so I'm a Venezuelan na native, but my family is actually from Argentina, so I grew up in this little bubble, cultural bubble of Argentina, and so I'm, I'm like half and half, you know, like the milk, half Venezuelan, half uh, Argentinian, and I came here to the United States uh, 21 years ago. I spent about 10 years in New York and then moved here to the West Coast and decided to call Seattle my home and build a family here. So I'm very happy here in the Pacific Northwest. I think it's because I had a little bit too much sun growing up. So I enjoy the tempered weather. Um, so today I have with me three amazing technology leaders uh, with Latino background. And they are part of the bedrock of technology here in the world capital of cloud, Seattle. So I'm really excited to introduce them to you. And I'd like to start with, um, let's, I, I'd like to start with Eugenio Pache. He is the CEO of um, Auth0, <laughs> I have a hard time saying that. So Eugenio, please uh, tell us a little bit about what uh, your company and, and your Latino background. Sure, thank you, Adriana. Um, well, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for hosting me and for having me in this session. And uh, hello to everyone, to the rest of the 40 plus people that are on the call as well. Um, I'm originally from Argentina, but like Adriana, I moved um, to the States, gosh, like many, many years ago. So now I'm, I'm uh, always considered myself a little bit of a native Pacific Northwesterner. Uh, I joined, I moved here because I joined Microsoft. I joined originally Microsoft Argentina, but then I moved uh, to Microsoft Corp and that brought me to this corner of the world. And I worked there for many years. And then in 2013, I left Microsoft and I started a company with a good friend of mine, uh, Auth0. And uh, Auth0 is a company that provides an API for developers to authenticate and authorize users. So anytime in, an, in any type of application, on a website, on your mobile apps or on devices, where you need to identify a user and decide what the user can do, you know, we are like the engine behind those two questions. Wonderful. And I know a friend of yours, uh, Manny Medina from Outreach, and you know we're customers of Auth0 and also of Outreach. So thank you, thank you. It's good to we love being your customers. So Manny, do, would you introduce yourself and tell us about your Latino background and the company? Although everybody knows Outreach. <laughs> Happy to. Thank you, thank you, Adriana, for having me. Um, I'm I'm uh, Manny Medina. I'm from um, I'm from uh, Ecuador originally. Um, I moved to the U.S. Um, like Eugenio many years ago, not many, many, just many years ago. And I, uh, I came here to finish uh, undergrad and to, and to, um, and to do my grad, graduate uh, uh, school. Um, I, I came to the Pacific Northwest uh, because Amazon hired, it, hired me to come in and work um, in the, uh, it started in Houston and then moved over to web services when Jesse took over. 
um, put some time there, some time at Microsoft, and then I quit. I started um, Outreach with uh, my three co-founders. Outreach, as you may know, is a pivot. Um, and what Outreach does is that we are the leading sales engagement platform. And what sales engagement means is that we manage the engagement. Honey, mm -hmm. you're going in and out. Did we lose him? I think we just lost him. Okay, well, let's, uh, we'll, when he comes back. Oh, there he is. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I don't know what happened. Um, it's the first time Zoom. Virtual world, virtual the internet. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so Outreach is a sales engagement platform that, that manages the engagement between your reps and their customers. And what we do is that we drive better engagement um, operational efficiencies and higher sales per rep, um, which makes you more efficient and drives more revenue. That's what. Great. And last but not least, Diego, are you? I'm looking for you in my boxes. There you are. Uh, you will please introduce yourself and tell us about Algorithmia. This is an AI company, right? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to, to be here. Well, you said that, uh, you know, Outreach and Outthrow are your customers of, so it sounds like I need to go talk to Bill about, uh, you know, adding a third uh, you know, to that list and, uh, you know, we should be customers of ours as well. Um, so I'm Diego Oppenheimer. Um, so I, I have a little bit of a, a mix. Um, I think my, you know, I, I was actually born in Chicago. Uh, my, uh, uh, while my parents were doing their uh, MBAs uh, in, uh, in the U.S., uh, I moved to Uruguay when I was six years old. And then I moved back to the U.S. Uh, to go do undergrad and university. So a little bit of a back and forth. So spent most of my school life uh, in Uruguay and then came here. Um, also Microsoft, that's how I ended up in the Pacific Northwest. So I've been in the U.S. since 2002 and then in the Pacific Northwest since 2008. Um, and uh, what Algorithmia does is uh, essentially what we, we, we work on is time to value of your machine learning efforts. So you have this technology called machine learning uh, in advanced analytics, which is helping optimize processes and um, and uh, improve decision making uh, across multiple industries and across multiple use cases in sales and um, in fraud. Um, and so the infrastructure needed to go build that out from a developer perspective and how to do the controls, how to do the governance and how to do the security is kind of what we provide as a software platform. Um, so that's what we build out and it's kind of this uh, new data stack that's, uh, that's coming out uh, of how do we do predictive analytics at scale uh, inside organizations. That's pretty cool, Diego. And how, so, I mean, that's a pretty, you know, advanced and all the new AI uh, technology. So tell, tell, tell us a little bit more, like how did you get into tech in the first place? Um, well, I think I was a, I was a little nerd when, since, uh, since a small child. So I think it was pretty obvious that that's where I was gonna, I, I was gonna end up being. Uh, uh, my father was an engineer uh, although later on went on to do other stuff, but I was an engineer by training. I got a, my first computer when I was, well, off of his computer. I think I was like eight years old or seven years old. Um, I had my own computer when I was like 10 and I was like starting to program. So it was pretty obvious that that was something was going to happen there. I was a tinkerer. Uh, my grandfather made me take apart radios and TVs and put them back together since I was a child. So. Uh, it was pretty clear that technology was going to be uh, that. How I actually got into the data analytics space was actually a little bit more interesting. Um, my, I needed to go do my, my first internship. Uh, I went back to Uruguay after my freshman year in college uh, at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, and I was kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And my dad said, uh, had been hearing about this new thing called business intelligence or how people were thinking about essentially historically looking at data and trying to make better decisions. He said, hey, you know, this is pretty interesting. You should look into it. Um, and uh, I applied as a consultant at, a, at a, a South American company called Quantum that does like Cognos reports and PeopleSoft, if anybody remembers that stuff. Uh, and uh, I, uh, my first day as a junior consultant with them, I was, you know, it was just coffee boy, right? At that point, do whatever they wanted me to do. Um, I go to the first call with him and the, the, the consultant goes to the person, it was like a retail store, uh, like a 7-Eleven. He's like, I'm gonna tell you something about your business that you don't know. That was the first thing out of his mouth. And I was like, wow, that is brave. Uh, and also kind of like, and he grabs some data from the person, it was like a spreadsheet, put some little charts on it. He's like, you see this, and you see that, and you see this. This is, you know, this is what you're doing in your business and maybe you should look at this and maybe you should focus on that. And I was mind blown by it. Like, it's just like, I, and I was like, I, I went back to school, I changed my major. 
like after that experience, like I had that sense, like, and I just fell in love with this idea that you can make better decisions and you can use data to drive business outcomes. Um, and I've dedicated my entire career to that. So that's kind of how I actually ended up in that space. Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I fell in that data as well. And I also come from a techie family. So I resisted though. I, I wanted to be an artist, but here I am <laughs> in tech. So Manny, Eugenio, either of you had a similar, did, did, uh, did you just like were tinkerers from the get-go when you're like, you know, babies or, or did you have a, a more wavy route into tech? Well, in my case, I'm, I think I'm the oldest of all. So, you know, my first computer was when I got it when I was maybe 17 or 18. So it was like towards the end of high school. Computers were really expensive. And uh, I had a friend. Um, actually, no, it's later than that. Now that I'm thinking about who gave me my first computer, he was a good friend of mine. So it was in, in the first year of, of uh, college. And... Uh, you know, he got a new one and he said, like, I'm not using this one. You can have it, it was a Texas Instruments uh, 90, um, 99, so TI-99. And it was like the thing that blew my mind. Uh, but I was also very, I have a very nerdy, you know, upbringing. So I was surrounded by radios and circuits and I was, I was attracted to technology in one way or another. My original passion was uh, was going to be um, rail railways. So I wanted to be a railway engineer. And then my father one day, you know, took me to uh, to the to the dining room in our home and says, I, "Do you see a lot of railways <laughs> happening in Argentina?" And I say, "Like, no, but that's that's my that's going to be my mission is to bring them all back." And I say, "Yeah, but no, it's not going to work." And so I switched. Uh, careers and I, and I I went to electrical engineering school so that was my my uh, initial uh, you know first steps into the into technology but then you know I discovered computers and the mix between electronics and computers and you know it was a whole branch of uh, of uh, opportunities and I got into software you know very very early on in my career you sound like my best friend growing up. <laughs> he had wired the whole room with cables and you sound like my brother yeah. too. Manny, yeah. how about you? Always a techie? No, I actually, I, I don't consider myself either a techie or an entrepreneur. I, um, I, uh, I, I, grew up, I grew up relatively poor, so I didn't have access to computers because as Eugenio mentioned, they were really expensive. Uh, it wasn't until college when I was in the middle of my first computer science class, I was taking algorithms and I was just doing them by hand. Cause at the end of the day, back when I went to school, I'm pretty old too. Um, you didn't have a computer at school. You, you sort of wrote your, 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 your answers in, in sort of like, you know, either pseudocode or C. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I sort of, I had great joy out of writing, you know, out of programming by hand. And it was kind of like poetry. And, and, you know, it, it got to a point and I imagine anything could be possible because it's, it, you know, and when you deal with words, anything is possible and you can build anything. You can imagine anything and just write it out. And that was my, my fascination with computers. It began through the algorithms and then eventually I got a computer and then everything was possible. I started making things because it was, it was possible. Um, and it wasn't until I came to college and until my, you know, even at, at my master's degree that I really got passionate about building software. Um, and then this is an idea that, that we had to, outreach is a pivot, so we had to build outreach to survive our last company. And sort of that's what got us into where we are. But uh, um, you know, I'm very proud of it, but I don't know how the, the techie, I, you know, I love technology because it's also a problem and it's, it, it's also a very big problem. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I can identify with that. Like I said, I don't have a technology background. I actually studied mass communication, but I do come from an entire tech family. My mom was in computer science and I have engineering, all of the engineer, even, even a nuclear physicist. And so when I had my first job in marketing was a, as a data analyst and I fell in love with data because I felt it was a great proxy for human behavior. So as a humanist, 
that was my still my approach. And so I love technology because it helps humanity. So I can identify with that. But you know, uh, Manny, we're all immigrants. So we all in one way, well, Diego, Diego is like the world tour immigrant. Uh, you're like immigrant both ways to Uruguay and into the US. <laughs> and so, uh, but so I'm curious, Manny, you know, building a company here. And I, I saw um, so yesterday that you posted on LinkedIn, you were talking a little bit about you know, your culture and your leadership and some of the radical um, feedback that Radical Kendall author, she's fantastic, uh, that really has, you know, coached a lot of people. So I'm curious about how, you know, from a, from a leadership standpoint, how have you, what's been your philosophy? What have you learned over time? And, and you know, maybe reflecting a little bit as an immigrant or, you know, and as a Latino, like, are there differences that you people from different cultures in, in terms of leadership style? Um, I, I don't, I, 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 I don't, it's hard for me to, um, you know, take a, a, a different perspective because I only, you know, I, I cannot speak from the point of view of somebody who's not an immigrant. So the only perspective that I have is me as an immigrant is, is what I am. But I, I can tell you that a lot of my upbringing in, I, I came to the U.S. when I was 21. Um, and I'm, and, and so I, I've been here for, for a while as well. And the, my, my, I came from a, the family that I came was pretty politically involved and it was pretty left. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I remember, you know, they were with the Workers' Party. I remember uh, going on marches and sort of, you know, the political discussions at the table were all about human rights and fairness and, and sort of equal opportunity and those kinds of things. So that's really informing who I am as a, as a, as a, as a, as a leader and as a manager, as a CEO. Um, and it has sort of formed my opinion of the world and how a company should be run. So, you know, just like Eugenio and Diego, we're, we're all took money from VCs and we're all, you know, fairly, we all expect to return that money seven, several times uh, in size. So we're all very aware of sort of the, the capitalist, you know, um, promise that we are fulfilling. But I'm also aware that, you know, the world is changing a little bit and, and the, and, and sort of the social issues and the social sort of like, you know, just like there is technical debt, we had accumulated all this, you know, socioeconomic debt in this country. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that you cannot talk about it anymore. I don't think that you cannot sort of bring that whole self to your company and your employees will bring their whole self to the company and you have to take a position. And, and because I'm so used to doing it, you know what I mean? Like from growing up and from, you know, being part of the, you know, the several sort of like, you know, toppling of the government, bank runs, and all this like economic crisis that we had. And I think Henny had to live some, some of that too. You know, I'm, I'm very much aware and more acute into, you know, this, this whole self view of the, of the team. Um, and I feel like a lot of our values, one, we have a value called, you know, having your back. And that's, that's a value that's pretty unique to us. Um, and from our core values to the people that we hired to sort of like the kind of things that I talk about with the company has, has sort of created a, a, a very unique sort of leadership style that is mine, right? That mm -hmm. is being informed by my upbringing in, a, you know, in Latin American country. So yeah, I think, I think it's been pretty, um, it, it's been pretty marked, you know, the difference between somebody like me and somebody who is just, you know, a, a great CEO who was born and raised here and, you know, went to Stanford and, you know, went through all the regular, you know, channels to get to where they are. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I haven't. And honey, you want to comment on that? You and I talked a little bit about that uh, the other day when we were talking about, you have a, an actually a multinational startup, which is pretty unique. And I, and of course, you know, Argentina um, is going through a lot of economical challenges and all that. So I'm wondering what's your perspective on, on leadership and culture in particular with dealing with all the economic woes of our, of our. Yeah. To, to your previous question on, on the, you know, what's a Latin trait you know, in leadership or in company building or in the, doing the things that Diego, Mani, and I are doing. I think it is, if there's one word to summarize it, at least for me, for sure, it's a grit. You know, like we are, I was born in a, in a country that was like always in trouble or uh, back then it was a military dictatorship for me. I mean, that tells you how old I am. And I grew up in an environment that it's uh, that, that if I can, if I now have to think about like looking at my kids doing the kind of things that I was doing at their age, you know, at 10, 11, 12 years old, which is my, my age back then, 
you know, I would be terrified just to let them out on the on the streets and just to play with other kids. And so that and all the difficulties of that many of our countries, you know, of origin in Latin America, they have all these um, not particularly, you know, like a, like a like a rich environment to to create companies. It's a, it's pretty hostile, you know, overall, there's no, and back then, even more so, perhaps the situation, the social situation, the, um, you know, there was no access to capital, there was no, look, I was born with no internet at all. <laughs> so, you know, even a phone was a luxury, you know, and, and so uh, greed and being able to solve problems creatively and not giving up and finding the way around like all the obstacles that, you know, it's inevitable in any enterprise you will encounter. It's one of the muscles that we developed in a way. And so it's like, um, like Mari mentioned, I think uh, the US, which is my country now, um, it's facing a lot of um, challenges in, in social structures and politically and in other ways. And I also see our companies now not just being economic engines, not just being another cog in, a, in the economic machine, but being like a platform for advancement, for human advancement and for change. And, uh, and so as you know, as our company has grown and our company has matured and we have the ability to do that, we invested a lot in social impact. We have like things that are not necessarily pure capitalistic, you know, it's, uh, it's reaching out to communities, reaching out to other people with maybe different opportunities. Um, in a way also, personally, it's a way to give back the opportunities that I had in life. Because, you know, I'm the product of uh, somebody or something giving me opportunities over time to reach the point where I am today. So, you know, somebody said like, you know, you spend the first part of your life, you know, learning the second part of your life on top of learning, you are building and the last part of your life, it's learning, building and giving back. And so I'm feeling now that I'm, you know, um, slowly entering into the, into the last, you know, third part of the three of them together. Yeah. Diego, I wonder what your experience is because if you had kind of like both, both up, you, you've had the chance to see it on both sides. I, I will say, I, I agree, you know, like I like the summary of like grit and creativity. Um, I think, you know, reflecting on where I came from, you know, Venezuela basically fell apart. And, um, and uh, I, I think there's a, a very, at least I've noticed a, a very common trait of entrepreneurism because it's it's hard and so you you know I my father my brother like myself since we were young we were already figuring out how to make money and how to you know present yourself fundraise like you work through I work through university my entire life uh, so by the time that I entered officially the you know like graduated college um, I think I had that sort of street knowledge experience perhaps that that many of my uh, colleagues of my age at 22 in New York didn't have. I found New York, uh, you know, like just go at it. And I was no one, had no money. I was very proud. I only asked my parents to give me $500. And that's how I got started. Uh, but so Diego, you've seen it both ways. You know, I'm sure you've worked with a lot of Latin, Latin American people or, you know, Hispanic heritage. Have you seen observed patterns or things that, that you think about? So I agree with Manny that, you know, like I can only speak for my experience, you yeah. know, where I see it. And I think it's a, it's a somewhat unique one because, um, you know, I, I think on top of the fact that, you know, kind of grown up in both places, um, I also come from like essentially a family of escaping Jews. Uh, so across both sides of my family. So from Germany, from my grandparents on my father's side, uh, from Hungary and Bulgaria uh, on, uh, on my mother's side. And so, the one thing that's kind of repeated a pattern in my family is there's not really a fear of starting from scratch, like starting over. So if I look at like every generation and also adding to Manny, like I have strong political folks in my family on actually both sides of the spectrum. Uh, so I had like, you know, uncles were revolutionaries 
and then you know family on the other, complete other side of the spectrum, which is always an interesting. Uh, but the family was somehow could be together and have those discussions, which is always also interesting. Um, and so, from my perspective, there's not there's not been a you know a, a fear of starting over. And actually, if I look back, I was just kind of doing the math in my head, like every single generation has started over from scratch in one way or another in different countries and different continents and different industries. Um, and so I think the, from my upbringing, I think my family just made it really cheap to think that way, right? In terms of like, you know, the cognitive load of just going and jumping in and starting from scratch and just, there's not a fear of it. There's like a, hey, this is what you do. Uh, you should be able to pick up and leave and go do something else somewhere else. I think that's there. Uh, I like the grit because you know, kind of a, there's, there's a term about Uruguayans called la garra charrua, uh, which is kind of how they describe the, 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 the you know, the, the soccer team, which I obviously love. Uh, and literally the translation is essentially kind of like the, you know, like essentially like the grit of the, like their indigenous population, the charruas, they were supposed to be, you know, they were, you know, well-known fighters. And so the entire country is known for that. So like, you know, in terms of very passionate, um, I think the other one, which is, and I, it's not the perfect word, but I can't, but I, because you, know, you can have a negative content. I call it shamelessness, uh, you know, which is there's just not like, you know, one of the things that I found is that we're, you know, Latinos are very okay just going and like, oh, I'll just call that person. I was like, oh, that's the president of the company. That's the CEO. It's like, so, like, you know, I, like, you know, like there's the kind of like this shamelessness of showing up. I'll, I'll just go there and talk to them. I'll just go to like, like, why not? Right. Like, why, you know, there's not like, there's kind of like, any social construct like oh that person's unattainable like nothing's unattainable you can just go and you know kind of like i don't know if it's a combination of pride self-worth shamelessness i don't know exactly how to like translate it like into the right wording but it's just that kind of like you just go and do it you just call the people you know you're like they don't know you you just get on the phone you show up at their door uh you do that and i think that's pretty common uh you know another trait or there's just kind of like again I'm looking for a better word than shamelessness because I think it has a negative connotation, but it's essentially that, right? Like just being completely shameless about uh, moving forward. It's almost like the, the, the authority and the roles are like, you know, suggestions. Like in, in many ways, like, uh, like uh, when, you, when you stop on a, on, a, on a traffic light, it's also a suggestion. <laughs> In Buenos Aires, it's certainly like, oh, it is a red light. Yeah, well, we suggested you that you stop, but it's not really like a mandatory. Maybe that same trait of questioning authority and questioning the rules, and in some cases breaking the rules, which is a bad thing, you know, when, when you take it to the extreme, it's a bad thing because some of our countries are like, you know, like lawless in a, I'm exaggerating, of course, but you see what I mean, right? Uh, but that gives us the, the permission to, you know, ask for, ask for forgiveness and not for permission, you know, kind of attitude, I think. Yeah, yeah. Manu, are you going to say something or? You're no, it, it's, it's true. And it's true in that, um, you know, it, it's a combination of sort of like the, the grit and the, you know, I, I love what Diego said about starting from scratch. Um, uh, my, 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 my family, you know, because we didn't have much, it, it didn't feel like you were losing much either. So there is the, the sense of like, you know, when you came, when you come here, if, if, you, if you didn't have much to begin with, there's nothing to lose. And that is incredibly liberating to start anything because you, you will take risks that you wouldn't otherwise do. Um, and, and I think that, yeah, no, I, I think that the, the, the one thing that I, I touched on on a, on a webinar the other day is that um, one thing that I think is particularly Latino is that we are easy to like. And because, because we're, you know, we care about the conversations, right? We grew up, nobody, you know, when we grew up, or at least where I grew up, people really care about how you were doing. Like, it wasn't like, you know, how are you doing? You said, I'm okay, you move on. You didn't have, you gotta get into a conversation a little bit. Somebody would say something about your clothes or bring something political or talk about, you know, the weather or, you know, this, the soccer match the day before or something, right? That it will always establish a conversation. And I took that to fundraising um, or, and into to, even to, to selling my, you know, first few customers. And I feel like, you know, that ability to just be easy to be liked and like somebody else work incredibly in my advantage, especially when you have to break a pattern, which is, you know, how do I invest in a guy who doesn't look like, you know, your average, you know, tech CEO. That's one thing that I think that we use to our advantage that is a very Latino trait. 
Yeah, that's that's a very that that's interesting. So, you know, since we're on that, you just open up that topic. And by the way, also for for the attendees, if you just a reminder, if you have questions, you can post it on the chat. I'm happy to ask ask them. But um, on that, have any of you, you know, uh, faced uh, I guess like challenges by you know being an immigrant or Latino or things that you feel like have been at at disadvantage, uh, particularly in the tech industry. And how have you tackled those? I look like a gringo, so it doesn't <laughs> like, I, you know, like I, I actually, I was, I was telling you Adriana the other day, like, I think it's actually funny because I think when I speak in Spanish, uh, people, especially to like Latinos, they, they kind of, especially in the US, they, you know, they, they, you can see in their face that their ears and their eyes are not matching and they're kind of confused about it a little bit because uh, it's not the, the, the typical profile. Uh, I think it's been an advantage from, uh, you know, better to what Manny said, right? Like you have to, like you, you, uh, it's very common to have conversations, understand like, like, how are you doing means something. It's not like an in passing or like how, you know, what are you up to? You know, how, how are things like, and we like kind of tie into that and getting those personal relationships just makes it easier. I think not fundraising and actually closing business. Um, I think in all of those, you can actually in calling favors when you need them. I think it's uh, it's been a little bit of a, an advantage. But I've again, as I said, I think I I don't I don't fit the general like physical profile, and so like I have not been like you know I haven't seen the other side of it, which I know exists like blatantly in the industry. Yeah. No. So to me, I I you know it, it's hard to piece apart you know what is normal sort of you know VC rejection from what is attributed to me. But I have gotten feedback, um, especially in the early days, that, that just didn't seem to match sort of my own profile. Like if, you know, I, I remember pitching to this one VC that was early stage and, and then sort of like turned me down saying that I'm, you know, I don't think you're technical enough, Manny. And I didn't even know how to take that. You know I mean? Like, cause what do you do with that? Like, how, like, do you don't like the idea? You don't like me? You don't, you like the market is not big enough? Like not being technical enough is not something you can work with. And it felt a little loaded because, you know, I, mean, I grew up as a programmer. The idea was pretty technical. I presented a bunch of charts. So like, I, I didn't see anything in particular as technical. So there is, there is sort of like, um, you know, there is, a, there is a fair amount of rejection it shows in the numbers. The numbers in this Hispanic investment is actually going down. Mm -hmm. So there's actually less investment in Latinx and, and black uh, entrepreneurs than it was, you know, five years ago. So there's clearly a trend going in that direction. It's hard to pinpoint it because you know VCs are really good at telling, turning people down. Mm -hmm. But the, the 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 part that I do acknowledge is that there is some amount of you know there's, it's not really microaggression, but it's there is some amount of discrimination in terms of you know what you get and, and the kind of pattern that you fit. Um, and it's born from this the fact that you know VCs are pattern matchers. So if you don't match, you know they they make decisions by matching to a pattern. And if you look different. You know, what I mean, I look like your gardener. Yet I'm asking for money. How is that going to How is that going to fit the pattern? It just doesn't. So they pass. Mm -hmm. um, and and until we don't get over this problem, right? Until there is no more, you know, until we don't manufacture more Eugenios, Diegos, and Mannies at scale, we won't be a pattern, and then we'll be the exception, and we'll have to explain our way out. So I, I think that there is that dynamic happening. Before. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, um, I, I first, before I came into the tech industry, I was in financial services and I was in, in New York, there is a lot more Latinos and it was quite shocking. I think the first time I really became aware of, of uh, you know, just seeing the, because I, I happened to be here in the US when I was five years. So I learned English really early. So I have a very slight accent and I'm white. So it doesn't, you know, so like Diego, not, not always, um, People assume that I'm a Latina unless I say it, unless unless I say it directly. But um, I've been in the room, and I had one of my really good colleagues, you know, Puerto Rican. She's um, Black Latina, and uh, she's PhD, like super prepared, ten times better than anything I could ever say. Very thick accent, and I just would see like people wouldn't take her seriously. People would question her way more than they would do me or any other person in the in the room just because you sound a little bit different and and um and so i don't know if you know like 
I don't know if any of you have seen that. Well, Manny, I think it's what you're saying. It's like, we really have to kind of push. And to me, like the big thing is like to change the room because when that becomes more normal, when you're not the only one in the room, that's when you start to, you know, like maybe the slight different accent or the per the fact they look different or, you know, to what whatever their image is. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've heard the like, really? But you don't look Latina. You don't look from Venezuela. I'm like, I, I look very Latina. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, but that's the, uh, you know, or like Diego, I'm sure you've gotten that. Like, uh, I mean, I don't know. They just, so I don't know. Ha have you, so if you've experienced it, have you seen what, perhaps like, what have you all done or how have you dealt with the type of situation where you do feel like it's, you know, a, either a microaggression or an actual, you know, heavier discrimination? Well, I, I didn't have any, personally, I've never experienced like a systematic discrimination. Uh -huh. Rejection, I experienced a lot, like throughout all my life. And not just here in Argentina too, you know, <laughs> pretty much everywhere I experienced rejection or, or, you know, like somebody saying no to what I wanted or my idea or my pitch or whatever it was. Look, even today, our company has grown. It's big. It's uh, you know, in in the latest fundraising efforts that we had, we still got no. I mean, it's not like uh, now that we are like bigger companies, we we maybe raised tens of millions of dollars, that we don't get no's anymore. We still, I still get no's from others. And maybe for me, the, the, maybe the, the approach that worked is that I, I always took the opinions, I always figure out maybe early on that the opinions of others are their opinions. And they're not the truth. And they're not facts. They're just their opinions. And so when somebody tells you no, they're just, ex just sharing with you what they think of the context. But that doesn't mean that it's the truth. And so the, what hurts you or what, what affects you negatively is when you, is your own personal reaction to what happens around you. And so like a, like a little trick that I used you know, with investors as a, to, to, to use a specific example is to always go in with a very different expectation. I never went to any conversation with an investor expecting them to become investors ever, even in the latest round. All my conversations with them were all about like, let me tell you what I'm thinking and I'm just gonna listen to your thoughts. And then I am gonna make a judgment on my own, separate from the outcome. And so, you know, without maybe mental hack, I never got disappointed because I never expected anything else than just an opinion, and that, that's what it was. Okay. The, good thing, the good thing, though, is that there are so many investors that you can get a thousand no's, and all you need is one yes. Yes, I like the 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 others uh, rejections are just suggestions or opinions, and and that actually dovetails well here with a question from the audience. Um, so perhaps Diego and Manny, you can jump on this, but they, they're asking like, how do you overcome these failures and, um, and what did you learn or what did you do differently? Yeah, so, so I, I, was, I was kind of thinking about it and like, uh, so anybody who's dated in Latin America, right? In any way, shape or form, knows like both sides of the equation are very confident in themselves, right? And so to that rejection point, you know, so like I remember going out you know, when I was, you know, in high school and you had the, you know, you know, you would ask a girl out and she would like, you know, like she had options, she knew her self-worth, you know, it was like, it was a very like, so rejection is part of the the story, right? Like, like you're just very used to it. You kind of like put it off to the side. So I like how like you think about it, like, just, you just can't, it's not about, you know, getting said no is not a value of your self-worth in any, in any way, shape or form. It's just about that particular interaction um, and going in and, and not, letting it occupy your space. So um, it sounds like I had not talked about it, but it sounds like Eugenio Manny had the same experience. I, I mean, I think, you know, my seed round, I think, you know, 
I got said no by like 60 VCs or something like that. Like, I mean, I can't even remember how many, like I, at one point I calculated how much, like, like how many coffees per dollar raised I had like consumed, like in terms of like coffee meetings. And it was just like, it was not a good number uh, for anything, right? And so just thinking about like, I mean, if, if, if you're going to be judging like what you want to do or you're passionate about or your idea by the other people saying no to you, like, it's just not going to advance. Like, I mean, like, and, and you can't say, it's not like you can't listen, right? It's not being blind about it, but like, you're not defined by the rejection, right? Like, that's not like, you're not just stopped by defining that. And it's going to happen. And it happens everywhere. Every day in your life, we, we live our lives being said no, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's essentially, you know, there's more no's than yeses in almost all cases. Uh, and so like being, you know, driven by that, I think is, uh, you know, it can get you in a bad, in a bad sense. I have a particular experience with product management and program management, because I think, you know, I was, I think this is my experience at Microsoft and I kind of tell people like, you live in a negative space because you're only looking at, and I have this problem today, by the way, which is you're only looking at the next problem and you almost like forget to celebrate, you know, so it's like, oh, this worked. Great. Boom. Out of my way. Like, what's the next problem, right? So you live in this space of, if you think about, I'm always addressing problems and I'm not celebrating the wins, you're spending 95% of your mental space attacking problems, which is usually good. And 5% thinking about the wins. Well, you're living in 95% negative space, right? From a mental state perspective. And like, I'm really bad at this. I don't have a solution. So if anybody's looking to me, like I'm like, my wife's talking about this all the time, which is I'm like particularly bad because I like, I get a win and I'm already thinking about the next problem. Like, great, we won. What's the next problem? And, you know, that's, uh, you know, it can get you in that negative kind of rejection like space, but it's also kind of like of just attacking the next problem that's there. So um, I don't have a solution to it. It's just, I'm just more venting on the problem that I presented for myself around that, which is kind of always living in the next problem to attack. Um, I, I think that um, I, I, I like what Diego and, and, and Eugenio said about, um, so taking everybody else's as a as a as an opinion, um, there's there's a couple of oh, hacks, you know, very particular hacks from from my point of view. So first of all, you have to accept where you are. Meaning, in the case of me, I am a Latino immigrant. I do look Latino. I speak Latino. Like people know that I have an accent. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be pecked down. So just stick with the peck down and take it from there. I don't have to, when I raise my first round, by the time I raise my seat round, I had already raised almost a million dollars in, in tens and twenties. So you will try to raise a million dollars in tens and twenties, takes a lot of conversations. But that's what you do, you know, because you're, you, you, I wasn't born here. I didn't have a solar spoon. So I start from the bottom, a little lower below. And my education is making a hundred friends that pay $10,000 each. That's what you do. So you put in the time, and then that creates a different sort of like, that creates a different uh, state for, for, for me. First of all, it makes me more resilient because my cap table has a hundred friends. Second of all, all of a sudden I have a network. And this is not a network of people who know you. This is a network of people who put money into you. So now all of a sudden this network is very invested in your success. And I feel that from then on, every single fundraise has been an intro from my network into a fund that put money in here and, I'll, and now I have more friends. And then the next investment is from, a, from the network into another friend and then to another friend and into another friend and you know, $290 million later, here we are. So the, the, I feel like you have, to, you have to sort of like not let, like to, to, to Diego's and Eugenio's point, just not let it get to you, whatever situation you're in. It is what it is, just work with it. Do look for your superpowers. And that was my original point in that I, I realize that I'm really good in one-on-one settings. I can, Adriana, if you and I are alone in a room, I will separate you from 10 grand. I can do that every day with any of you. I'm just really good at it. And that's my superpower. People like me and they want to invest in me. They want to invest in me, not in the concept. And a lot of decisions are kind of like that in that um, people make an emotional decision and then they back it up with facts. You see what I mean? The moment you walk into a VC room with a lot of, you know, white dudes who never seen you before and never met you before, they already made up an opinion of you. And they're just trying to back it up with facts. They're trying to find the wrong Pam, the fact that I don't look the part, the fact that, you know, I don't understand sales. I remember a local VC, I walked into the meeting and they asked me, how do I re- generate revenue? I say, I sell. 
And they were like, no, 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 but how do you generate demand? I sell, I call people, I take the phone book, open it up and call someone. And they like, you know, right there and then the meeting die, right? Cause they've never seen anything like this, but that's what I do. So you, you have to, you have to sort of like build your own narrative in a very positive way. And in a way that fits you and it meets you where you are. And then you sort of take and create your own reality, right? And then your reality will be, you know, what you want it to be. So my, my advice to you is, is just stick where you are, take, take the best of what you can do and just keep a positive mindset because that's all you have. Yeah. Um, I, I have another question here for related to this to, to um, overcoming. And, and one of you had mentioned originally about, oh, I think Eugenio, you were talking about where the result of people opportunity. So did any of you help you in this journey? Like, did you have um, any mentors that uh, really, you know, helped you get to where you are or open up opportunities for you? Lots. And uh, perhaps my biggest mistake in, in life is not being uh, deliberate about it earlier in my career. Then later in my career, I, I figure it out and say, oh, you know, this is uh, actually something I need to develop on my own, right? And you can be, you can also teach others and that also um, teaches you in that process. So it's, a, it's like a multi-dimensional thing. But I was lucky that early on in, in my, in life really, whether it was, um, you know, in high school or in college for sure, my first jobs, I always found, I had this, this um, you know, fortune to, of finding people that I could look up to, I can learn, I can, I could, you know, make the most of that relationship. So, you know, there's so many that I ended up writing a blog post on all of them. So, you know, if you want to go and see the details, there's a, there's a blog post on my public, my personal public uh, blog where I go through everyone and each one and what is it that I learned from each one of those. But later in my career, I figured that it was so valuable that it was something that I could invest and be more proactive and not just leave it up to good luck to just find great people around me. Um, and it, you know, it was less serendipity and it was more, you know, more thoughtful about it. I would say, I mean, exact same thing. I think I should have been a lot more deliberate earlier. Um, my approach also has been, so I love having conversations and I feel very uh, honored that I can actually call on people at any time, you know, like these are people on this call. Like I, I've called Bill multiple times uh, to ask him about stuff. And uh, one of the things that the best piece of advice I got earlier was um, in close to what Manny was saying about surrounding yourself with this, like, you know, larger and larger group of friends, which is understand the different people in your network's superpower, right? And where you can have those conversations where they can, you can learn a lot from. <laughs> and it's not about having a mentor, which is like a deity to you. And you're just like, oh, everything they say. No, it's really about being able to have these multiple opinions. And so I was very deliberate when I started the company in terms of, okay, who was the person that I would go through for product advice or thinking about things through product, which even though that was my strength, um, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, friends with another, like, you know, Latino CEO, uh, Forrest Key, who's in Seattle. And, you know, he's amazing at diversity and about creating a population of people under him that are like very diverse in how they look and their preferences and everything. And I thought that was really inspiring. I didn't know how to do that. And so having deliberate coffees with Forrest to just talk about that and understand that this was his superpower to a certain degree amongst other things. And so being able to just kind of understand that you have a, you can build this deliberate network where the people in that network have really strengths and that you can take those tidbits that allow you to develop your opinion uh, or your suggestions around things. It's super valuable. And um, I will double down on what Eugenio said that if I think I, you know, I'm 10 years late to the game, I should have started way earlier on that one. Yeah. And well, you know, we're coming up with time. I do have another, uh, maybe a last question for, from the, just to dovetail that from the uh, audience here. Um, so speaking of that, of mentorship and, you know, obviously we're all here because we want to uh, increase the amount of, of Latinx people in, in technology. So uh, Manny, maybe we can start with you. What, what do you do at a, you know, are there things that you're doing at a personal level or at the company level to, you know, to mentor or to help, um, you know, grow uh, more 
careers of people from people with Latin, Latin uh, American background? Um, you know, it, it varies. It varies with my my time availability. I met I, I vol early on in outreach uh, time. I volunteer in Code Twenty Forty, mm -hmm. uh, and I was a mentor to um, to a kid from Colombia who went to um, who went to actually he got into YC and started his own company. Uh, and it was it was very rewarding um, to see you know another Latino immigrant you know get on the on the path of, of doing really well. Um, the you know, I also try to do things that are a bit more scalable, such as, you know, conversations at broader scale. Um, you know, I'm very good friends with uh, David Cancel and uh, Elias Torres from uh, Drift. And they uh, they have a, a very strong platform to sort of spread the word around, you know, this new generation. You know, what does a new corporation look like? And, the new, and in their mind, the new corporation looks like it has more color, it has more diversity, it has more opinions. It has just, you know, it just looks different. Um, and I'm very, you know, I'm very committed to that. Uh, and I'm very committed to that for two reasons. One is that, you know, I just feel more comfortable when there's more color in the room. Because that's a, that's a, you know, Ecuador is, is, is has, a, you know, a lot of different kinds of populations. Um, you know, we have the indigenous, we have, you know, we have, you know, in, in the range, you know, from, from brown to, to very, very dark, every single color is available and the sun is there. And I just, you know, I personally feel more comfortable in those environments and I want to see that for, for, for myself and I want to see that for America. Um, so I, 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 I try to do one-on-ones as much as I can uh, in terms of mentorship. And most of the time I spend just trying to counsel or, or advise people sort of in this setting, right? I sign up in something like this and people just ask me questions about the things that I'm, I do well, right? Like I'm really good at fundraising and I'm really good at selling. So, you know, I open up my time for that kind of, for the stuff that I'm good at. Yeah, really appreciate you participating today. Uh, Diego and Eugenia, well, how about you? What what things you feel you, you do or we can do better as a as a as a uh, community to help more Latinos grow in tech? So I'll you know I think you know I've just operated on the you know pay it back principle like very aggressively in the sense that like I got so much help like so much help like across the board getting to where you know we're at today and I will won't be successful if I don't get a whole bunch more help from other people around that. And so uh, I just go under the, you know, the assumption that, you know, you have to, you have to return that and you have to do that like purposefully. So uh, a couple of things I do are, you know, I usually on, on Sundays, I do founder calls um, and I'll just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a couple hours and be like, if I can help you, how, like, let me understand how I can help you and try to do that. Um, I've been involved a little bit with Endeavor uh, in Latin America. So uh, around that, um, and then whatever there's startups in Uruguay, it's a very small ecosystem. Like we just, uh, the first unicorn ever in Uruguay, it was just created. So in, in its history, so there's a company called D-Local. Um, so in the history of the country, the first unicorn just popped up in the last fundraise. Um, and so, so it's a very, very early, early, but um, I, I make it a point to not say no time permitting, which is always a problem. Like, you know, when, if somebody asks, if somebody asks and they're saying, Hey, I want 30 minutes of your time. Like somebody absolutely gave me 30 minutes of their time. So like, I'm, I, I try to make it a point to go that. And then uh, I generally agree with what Mani said in terms of, it's not just that, like, I don't think companies are going to be successful if they don't have more color in the room. Like, I actually think it's an existential threat. Like, like it's, it's even beyond like what we want or comfort with. Like, I think like the lack of diversity and I see this in organizations is an existential threat to that organization. And so you kind of, you know, going back to the survival and shamelessness, like you have to fix it or you're going to die, uh, you know, in the process. And so I think uh, I feel pretty strongly about that, as you can see. And so like, I think that's, uh, you know, very important. What about you, Mahonia? Well, for me, it's actually very similar. So I, I like to be involved in, in community opportunities like this one. You know, these are things that I typically say yes to um, only because, you know, it gets me connected with a broader set of people from at different stages of, you know, their careers as well. Uh, like Diego, we are also an, uh, involved with Endeavor and, uh, you know, that gives us a more, like a more repeatable, process to engage with uh, early stage companies, especially in all Latin, Amer Latin America. And then I you know the last piece for us is that 
you mentioned before that we are a global company and we are also a distributed company. So first we were distributed, then we were global, and maybe one was a consequence of the other. But just to reinforce the what Diego said and Mani said, you know, like the fact that by 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 nature of hiring for talent and then for time zone and then for zip code. You know, we already get like the benefit of hiring people from all over the world. And, uh, you know, anywhere there's uh, humans, there's talent. There's not like talent just in Seattle or in San Francisco or in New York or in, I don't know, Sao Paulo or Buenos Aires. There's, there's talent everywhere. We have people in the most remote places of the world, you know, um, uh, contributing to, to our mission. And by doing that, it already creates a much richer environment where we can learn from different perspectives, different interests, different requirements, different constraints that people have and or uh, communities have. And that has allowed us just to, to maybe use one example of the direct benefits of that approach or the why diversity works. You know, it has allowed us to to essentially create more um, empathy with our customer base because you know we have our own employees in those regions and in those countries and in those communities where um, they they're in tune with what works, you know, what doesn't, how they learn, how they try, how they buy, all of that, which has been invaluable. Yeah. Yeah, that it, well, and, it, and especially now in the COVID uh, era, I think having a company that's already uh, distributed and remote, and uh, that's that's a fantastic advantage, Eugenia. So congratulations on yeah. figuring that out before uh, many. <laughs> so, uh, well, so I, you know, I, I want to ask you one last question before we go to breakouts, and uh, Joanna, if you can uh, please post uh so what's going to happen in the, in the in the next half an hour from 1 30 to 2 pacific time is that we are going to go into each company is going to host their own breakout and so uh the the attendees if you can choose you can actually switch from zoom to zoom and then you can have a more private conversation about job opportunities and more about the company and uh, maybe have a little bit more conversation so if we were in person this would be the networking aspect of of the time but so just to close off as we go into zoom i each one of you tell me one food that you are um that you uh, really miss, or it's like your, your what do you call it? like your favorite makes you feel at, right at home? Well, for me, it's an easy one. It's a barbecue. Bife, okay. <laughs> Diego? Same. Yeah, same, asado. I mean, I actually, I actually built a, a, a proper asado thing in my house so I can actually do the proper asados. I missed it so much. Yeah, that, I'm expecting that invitation uh, right after that. <laughs> so, Manny, how about you? For me, it's uh, ceviche. Ceviche. I, I miss ceviche tremendously. Yeah. Well, to me, this is my combination: milanesas with uh, fried plantain or platano frito. With that's my Venezuelan and Argentinian culture <laughs> right there. And that's that's home cooking for me. So I need some milanesas. All right. Well, very much. Thank you so much. We will see you then uh, in each of your breakouts. And thank you, everyone, that joined and asked questions. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you. And uh, happy. This is the end of the Hispanic Heritage Month. So thank you so much for everyone. Thank, thank you. you.